Heads up, audio listeners, you're about to hear a videotaped conversation. For the full experience, you'll find the video version of this episode on Spotify or YouTube. Let's bathe in nostalgia for a second. Mm. What is your first memory of going to a theater and recognizing it as being like, this is a great place to be? My mother, she told that story many times. She took me to see a Tom and Jerry marathon at the San Luis cinema. I was four, five, and I asked her what channel was that with a very loud uh, voice. You know. In the theater while you were in the yeah, theater? Yeah, yeah. What, like, what, what channel what is this? What channel is this? <laughs> yeah. Because you'd only seen TV. Yeah. That is Ken winner Kleber Mendoza Filho. He grew up to be maybe the most celebrated filmmaker in Brazil. And his latest movie is all about his life as a cinema goer, or more accurately, about cinemas themselves. It's a documentary called Pictures of Ghosts, a look back at the movie palaces Filio grew up in and around in his hometown of Recife, most of which are now gone. And right after the film debuted in a town ironically full of cinemas, we talked about it. I'm Rico Galliano. This is the Movie Podcast. Welcome back to our special season of conversations from the 2023 Cannes Film Festival. This is episode two, Clever Mendoza Filio on Pictures of Ghosts. Really briefly describe your movie because it's very personal and I'd like to hear from your point of view where it comes from and like what, how you would describe it. Well, I think it comes from um, images I have kept f- over many years. Uh, I shot a lot of the footage when I was still in university. Uh, at the time I had a a very simple VHS camera. And uh, I also shot still photographs, 35 millimeter. And at the time, uh, the old uh, movie palaces were closing from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. This is what year? Very late 80s, uh, early 90s. And I was very much aware that that would be gone in a few years. So uh, I I took uh, pictures and I shot video. Over the last 30 years, I kept these tapes and negative and and slowly I got back to them about 10 years ago and I thought that time was quite generous to the material and uh, that's when I, I thought that I could maybe put something together you know like a, a film what do you mean by time was quite generous you take a photograph today and uh, maybe next year you will look at it and say oh that's a nice photograph but in about 10 years, it will begin to change because you have changed and uh, maybe the person who is in the photograph is no longer around or maybe you don't talk anymore or maybe you don't really wear those clothes anymore and, uh, and maybe the look of the photograph and technology changes also. So a lot of these pictures, they were negative, black and white. They began to change in a way. Emotionally emotionally aesthetically and what they mean there is more to them than the than there used to be when you first looked at them and the same thing with video for instance i rediscovered this moment in the film where you can see the box office it's a box office from the 1940s it's completely intact and the you know the machine the cash register it's completely analog yeah Big, huge buttons. Yeah, it becomes an interesting image because today you can get your phone and buy a ticket for uh, a Anything. film you're going to see in two weeks at 2.45 on a Wednesday. So I, I had all this footage and then I thought that I should look for more footage, more pictures from friends and archives. And I discovered that families are great archives. Each family has its own archive. Archivist? Yeah. Archivist. Yeah. It, it depends. Could be an uncle, a mother, a, a son, someone who takes care of the pictures and, and super eight, um, old Super 8 reels. And also the uh, Brazilian Cinematheque, and I kept finding things. And each time you find something, uh, the film changes. And it was, uh, yeah, it was a fascinating process. So at base, it's about the vanishing of these uh, movie palaces. But you start with a fairly lengthy, it's like a half an hour of the film, 
on your own house yeah. in Recife, which is not far from a lot of these palaces. Mm -hmm. But why start there? First of all, I when we were editing, I wasn't really happy with how pragmatic the film was in terms of oh I'm making a film about movie palaces. Coincidentally, we we were about to move. Your family? Yeah, my family. It wasn't easy uh, to leave that place. I had made many films in that place. It, it was our home, but it, it was also a film set because uh, I started making all these short films uh, 30 years ago, 33 years ago. And then I thought that it wasn't so different to think about uh, the city center and also to think about my house because it's been shot so many times from so many different angles. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that could be an interesting uh, take on, on, on space. Yeah, and that's kind of what my takeaway from this is that it's not even just about movie theaters. It's about <laughs> our relationship to buildings space. in a way, and spaces. Yeah. I also spoke to Vim Vendors this week. Yeah. He, who's got a film here at Cannes, he has said that he in a different life would be an architect. And I know that I've heard other filmmakers refer to this. And I wonder if we, meaning cinephiles, people who spend a lot of time in movie theaters, I wonder if because we grow up in buildings, having these incredibly heightened experiences, like over and over and over again, often in very specific buildings, if that makes us more into places. Well, it's an interesting theory. I myself... Uh, considered uh, architecture when I was about to apply. Seriously? Yeah, to university. But then I found that there was quite a lot of math, maths. <laughs> so I decided to go for journalism. And then my brother did uh, architecture. He's an yeah. architect. He's in the movie. Yeah, he's in the film. And, uh, but I, yeah, but I, I'm fascinated by architecture and by the way we shoot. Uh, architect, we, why, the way we translate space in, into film. I'm not really into, there is a certain style in filmmaking where you don't see, I mean, the face is in focus, but everything else, the ear would be out of focus already and you can't see where the character is. And maybe there is a, a dramatic function for that, but the whole film like that, you know, I, I want to see where he or she is. Yeah, spaces are important. Yeah. yeah. So I grew up in a town called Pittsburgh. And there's a public uh, TV station there. And they have a series called Things That Aren't There Anymore. Mm. And it's basically exactly your film. It is, but in a totally different and far more like straightforward way. Mm -hmm. It's, and I love it by the way, but it's like, what, wasn't it great back then? Remember this old thing? Mm. Wasn't that cool? And that's not the movie that you've made. Mm -hmm. How did you keep yourself from making that kind of movie? Cause I think it'd be very easy to be like, oh God, I love this place. Mm. Isn't it wonderful? Well, I probably would have made that film 15 years ago. But since then, I think I learned that cities change. They change organically and sometimes they change in a brutal way just because a group wants to make a ton of cash and then they pull strings and then they make things happen or they make places disappear. That's not organic but it is organic if you think in terms of corruption as being part of life in society and i think uh, cities uh, especially under a heavy uh, capitalist uh, system they often change uh, in brutal ways and I, I i think that happens more often in the americas and in asia north america central america and latin america cities change in a very brutal a lot of demolition and of course, it's fascinating. I mean, coming to the Cannes Film Festival, this, the city itself doesn't change, but the structure for the festival keeps changing. Hmm. Like the hotel now is not the Grand Hotel. Oh yeah, that's right. It's this hotel else. is the Mondrian. We're, we're, we're just outside the Mondrian. Hotel. Yeah. So yesterday I was giving, given the information to come to the Mondrian. I said, I, I, I don't know where, it, I, what is this? And then I, later I found out that it's just the Grand Hotel. So uh, your internal map keeps not, it doesn't change because it's your map, but it, you have to change it because yeah. changes have been made to the map, you know? And I think it's fascinating. Yeah. But the, the difference being that you now accept that 
or and or are fascinated by it less than being kind of like, oh, remember that grand old thing? We're, well, yeah, I mean, I, I could still insist, yeah, I gave an interview at the Grand Hotel today, but it isn't, you know? Uh, so, but I, I did not want to fall into that trap and, oh, it was, things used to be so much cooler in the past, you know? And it's not, um, I think there are great um, things about today. But you do at a certain point say, there's been a loss to these cities because these movie with, palaces are gone. With the m movie Marquise. It's the Marquise specifically yeah, the Marquise that you think is the loss? specifically, yeah. Explain why. I now, I now remember why, but because explain. I, I this is something that I loved, and Marquise are pretty much gone. Even the last one in, in Sao Paulo now, um, in one of my favorite movie theaters, they, they used to have a marquee up until before the pandemic, and now it's gone because it's too complicated to put the the letters up yeah the but uh, what i used to like about the marquees is that it really felt like you were witnessing messages being exchanged between cinemas and between the street and the cinema mm -hmm. so you would walk by strange bird of youth all right <laughs> why not <laughs> if you don't know the movie it's... yeah it's it's a, it's like a strange message so in a way i i miss that but it doesn't mean that the past was better you know the veneza cinema was a great cinema and it it's gone now but we still have the san luis which is like a time machine with a thousand seats you know? it's true and that you do end uh almost end on the San Luis. By the way, what do you want us to take from that ending on the San Luis? Do you, is, is this a message of hope? Is it a message of, you know, let's preserve these things? What? Well, the fact that it still exists, is, it's quite hopeful because uh, most cities have not uh, been able to save. Um, I mean, as far as I know, Manhattan has not been able to save any of the great movie palaces. Maybe up in the Bronx, something? Or? I'm sure somebody will write in yeah. to tell us that there are palaces, probably several of them, but I'm not sure. I'm, I, certainly a lot of them are. I gone. thought the, the Ziegfeld was the last one. That, uh, I mean, the Radio City Music Hall is still there, but I don't think they show films there. Yeah. Uh, Sao Paulo, for example, is, a, is an amazing city and they haven't been able to save anything or they wished, mm. they made the decision not to save anything. Recife has two, Sydney has the State Theater, um, San Francisco has the, the Castro, but the Castro has changed uh, yeah. recently a little bit. It's more music yeah. uh, oriented. Uh, LA, I'm happy to say, has many, but you would think so. LA and has many and LA has a strange geography because it has a it has almost like a cemetery of yeah. cinemas that don't really work anymore yeah you're but talking about there. downtown yeah some of them are reopening for some good. of them are reopening yes. um but mostly it's concert halls yeah um that's in, specifically in downtown there used to be a stretch where there was like one every block yes. and a lot of them are concert it's halls one of the too. i'm fascinated by movie palaces it's one of the most uh, fascinating areas uh, downtown la Let's talk about the very ending of the movie, though, mm. which I won't, I'll try not to give spoilers. Yeah. It is very unlike the rest of the movie. It's a little fictional coda mm -hmm. at the end, starring you yeah. in an Uber. <laughs> and m my takeaway from it, without giving away the twist, is that it's it, like shows some uh, trepidation, let's say, about like the coming AI. AI? No, I never, not really. I, I, I think the scene is really about. Um, it sucks that uh, we, we can't we, tell what people what we're yeah, talking about. Well, it's a very we haven't had specific. a car in the last eight, eleven months, and we're really happy with uh, <laughs> that new situation. Not having a car is quite liberating, and uh, and I've been using taxis and and you know these transport apps and Uber, and then but but it was an idea that I had been thinking for many years. Uh, I've been making the film for many years to end the film uh, with me in an Uber. But then on the day we were going to shoot, you know, you spend so much money to shoot something like that, you get the equipment and the actor. And, and I began to worry that we didn't really have anything to say in, in the car. Mm. And that's when I wrote the, the actual dialogue. 
And I called a friend of mine who works with VFX and I said, can I do this? Oh yeah, it's really easy. There's a special effect involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, without Very giving simple it away. and cheap, yeah. <laughs> yes. But it works. Yeah. It does, but but you don't think it has anything? Oh, let's just say, again, without giving the thing away, I, f- I feel like it alludes to driverless cars, the coming of driverless cars. Oh, really? Oh. That's what it evoked in me. Maybe that's because I live in LA where uh-huh. like those actually are starting yeah. to happen. Interesting. No, I really think it's about some ghostly yes. um, incident. <laughs> you you want it to is, be taken as a little bit of a spiritual moment. Well, I mean, you. I mean, it, it, it's also your film. Once you see it, I mean, you you make you you have your own. Uh, you can have your own take on the. It's actually an interesting take about AI, but it never crossed my mind. It was really about strange things that happen at night in a city you know i really like that idea oh, so for example we have the the vampire from a wonderful 1981 short film a local hisifi short film from Jean-Marc Moniz de Brito. I mean, he, he's seen him three times in the film. Yeah, you, you show this clip several times and yeah. he's kind of like bat-like, this yeah. guy wearing a cape going down the Yeah, bridge. Nosferatu kind of. But, well, so then do you think that's the connection this coda has to the rest of the movie is this idea of strange things happening at night? I think of cinemas, even though they have matinees, obviously I think of it as a nighttime activity. Is that like, is it part of that fabric? Well, I, I really like the... At least my my feeling that the first part has nothing to do with the second part, and the th- and the coda has really nothing to do with the rest of the film. But of course, I know that they are all interconnected yeah. in my mind. Maybe there is a personal logic to it, you know. But it's a film about ghosts and places that don't exist anymore. And I really love the idea that someone is so proud of his ability to just not be there. Yes, You've, we've just given away the. Uh, <laughs> the and it do, well, do you care? Kind of not really. I, I haven't really given everything away, but not being there could, could mean many things. But it's also a good image in film, I think, not being there. Yeah. The last shot of the film, though, is you looking out the car. Well, I don't know if it's specifically you, but it's shots out the car window, mm-hmm. and it's of a fairly bland landscape. And it's mostly, I don't, I, I, I'm sorry that I don't speak Portuguese, so mm-hmm. I can't translate all the signage that you see, but it seems like it's mostly like drug stores. Drug stores, yeah. That's, that's the last image. Yeah. And rather than these grand movie palaces, it, it's a, it feels like a downer to me, <laughs> even though you're saying that it's like it wasn't better back then. It feels like it was, in that case, a little better back then. I can't help noticing when I go back home at night, uh, we, dro- we drive by a lot of drug stores. And it's, uh, I think it's kind of funny and sad and, uh, and it's, it's an interesting image because they are so bright. It's almost like, oh, another drugstore. I think it's a good image. I'm not sure what it means. It's probably a bit of a downer, you know, you know. and they're open 24 hours. Clever Mendoza Filio. His movie Pictures of Ghosts is coming soon. If possible, do try to see it in an actual cinema near you. You don't know what you've got till it's gone, people. Meanwhile, this episode of the movie podcast was hosted and written by me, Rico Galliano. Kira McKinniff is our booking producer. Amos Levin edited the show, and Michelle Cho is our supervising editor. Yuri Suzuki composed our theme music. Our camera crew and can included Cedric Azar, Alice Dupla, Rob Godfrey, Solal Kolol, and Matis Toti. Special thanks to Mubi's team in can. Elodie Fagan, Eric Eisenberg, Sam Letter, Elias Malki, and Josefina Perez Portillo. This series is executive produced by me, along with John Baranachea, F.A. Chacarell, Daniel Kasman, and Michael Taka. And of course, to stream the best in cinema, head over to Mubi.com to start watching. Next episode, it's my chat with Quebecois director, star, and can favorite Monia Chaukri. Till then, travel tip if you order a martini in France, they'll give you vermouth on the rocks. <laughs> <laughs>